All right, hi, uh, my name is Fry, and today I will be talking to you about the relationship between anxiety, cognitive processing, and error monitoring. Let's first start off with anxiety. Anxiety is one of the most common and widespread mental health problems facing individuals in the United States today. Estimates show that up to 30% of the U.S. adults will experience anxiety at some point in their life. Um, but when we talk about this word anxiety, it's really an umbrella term that encompasses a lot of different behavioral and psychological reactions to stress and trauma. The thing that we're going to be talking about today is generalized anxiety disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder, or GAD, has a variety of symptoms, including psychological arousal, constant and uncontrollable worry, as well as strategic avoidance behavior. Now, anxiety often serves to have an evolutionary adaptive benefit of helping individuals respond to new and threatening situations. But anxiety, when overused, it can lead to negative impacts on functioning and performance. And so understanding this relationship between anxiety and performance is integral to helping those individuals understand both the sources and the effects of their anxiety. So one thing that deals with this relationship is called attentional control theory. Attentional control theory rests on a basic differentiation between two kinds of attention. First, there's goal-driven attention, and secondarily, stimulus-driven attention. Now, these two different processes are actually interrelated. And the main parts of the brain in which they function, in particular the anterior cingulate cortex, um, all rely upon the same finite cognitive capacities of the central executive control system. So, under this theory, when anxiety occurs, it is because a goal is threatened. So this threatening new goal leads to a decrease in overall goal-directed attention, an increase in stimulus-driven attention in order to ascertain the source of this new threat. This change in the cognitive processing resources leads to uh, more attention being given to task irrelevant stimuli at the expense of task relevant stimuli. Now, uh, while a lot of research uh, has gone into uh, the relationship between uh, anxiety as well as error monitoring, um, there's a new field of evidence that is trying to add some quantitative evidence to this attentional control theory. And by exploring the relationship between anxiety and your air, air monitoring through exploring event-related brain potentials, or ERPs. Now, event-related brain potentials uh, occur <laughs> when you are hooked up to an EEG because the brain uh, communicates through both chemical and electrical signaling. We can actually observe the electrical activity in the brain through looking at the fluctuations in the voltages of groups of neurons. So this will happen in response to all types of events. Um, for example, when a uh, mistake occurs, you'll see a sharp negative deflection occurring approximately 50 to 100 milliseconds after the event occurs, and this is called error-related negativity. But what does this have to do with anxiety? Well, great question, Fry. Uh, the main reason is that most of the error monitoring occurs in the same location in the brain, in particular the anterior cingulate cortex, that also uh, has to do with attentional control theory. Uh, so anxiety, because it's increasing your vigilance to new sources of internal threat, will increase your overall error monitoring. Uh, and so, while the ERN has been shown to be a good static biomarker indicating your relative levels of anxiety risk, there's been surprisingly little research demonstrating effectiveness of traditional forms of therapy, such as CBT, uh, in treating and reducing this ERN effects. Which is where my study comes in. It's called the Effective Expressive Writing on Error-Related Negativity Among Individuals with Chronic Worry. So the authors hypothesized that the reason that CBT wasn't uh, being shown to be effective in reducing ERN was that it wasn't getting to the source of the issue. Uh, instead, it was potentially exacerbating it. So instead, the authors turned towards a more targeted treatment, expressive writing. Expressive writing has a long history of both positive uh, physical and mental uh, health effects. Um, uh, however, with the desire for increased performance, it's been shown historically to lead to worries that take up cognitive space in the brain, uh, particularly in line with working memory. So the authors hypothesized that by using expressive writing, they could offload some of this, uh, the space they're taking in working memory and allow better psychological or better cognitive performance. So the overall hypothesis was that expressive writing would reduce the amount of overall uh, worrisome thoughts, leading to fewer distractions and therefore a decreased need for compensatory cognitive control, as you reflected through the ERN levels. However, the authors didn't think that the relationship between ERN and actual performance was strong enough that they could predict a change in performance as a result of this reduced ERN. So, now let's talk about the method. <laughs> um, first, uh, first, the authors started off by screening 1,462 college-age students for anxiety using the Penn State Worry Questionnaire, or PSWQ. 
They narrowed this down to 44 individuals who scored above a 61 on the PSWQ, which is the widely accepted cutoff for generalized anxiety disorder. Due to problem complications of the EEG machine, four results were dropped, leading to a final sample size of 40 participants. Another interesting note is the authors actually chose to use exclusively women in the study, because the relationship between ER and anxiety has historically been stronger than women. Next, the participants, uh, the participants were hooked up to an EEG machine, I like this picture a lot, uh, and then told to take the state trait anxiety uh, integrated state test, in which they could establish, therefore, a baseline level of anxiety for all the participants before uh, engaging in either the expressive writing or the uh, control condition. After that, the, all the participants were randomly sorted into two groups. There was an expressive writing group as well as a control group. In the expressive writing group, participants were asked to convey their deepest thoughts and emotions about the task at hand. In the control group, they were asked to uh, in the control group, they were asked to write about an unrelated unemotional event. Participants then sat at their monitors for eight minutes and typed out this expressive writing exercise, uh, followed by four minutes of contemplation before going on to what's called the flanker task. The flanker task uh, has individuals respond using a keyboard to a series of congruent and incongruent letter combinations. So in this example, uh, if the middle letter was an M, the, the participant might be asked to respond to their left hand. If the middle letter was an N, might be asked to respond to their right hand. Um, I did a series of it. I did a version of the flanker task, and let me tell you, it's really perfect if you want to reduce a lot of errors. Um, finally, they were then, the participants were all then taking on another series of psychological studies so they could gauge the difference in the overall level of psychological arousal before and after the uh, treatment. So let's talk about results. The first thing that the researchers did was try to make sure that the manipulation was effective in leading, bless you, to express writing. Uh, and so while they found no actual difference or statistically significant difference in the overall length of the essay, the, writers, or the experimenters did find that the manipulation was effective in leading users or participants to uh, engage in expressive writing through the use of more uh, affective language. Secondarily, they found that neither of the writing conditions increased general, general levels of anxiety. However, they did find that participants who were in the expressive writing condition showed higher levels of MASQAA scores, which is indicative of overall levels of anxious arousal following the completion of the entire experiment. Finally, in line with the researchers' hypothesis, they found that the ERN, ERP responses were overall tempered for those who were inside the expressive writing condition. This graph on the left demonstrates the ERP response to the correct and incorrect answers, as well as the difference between the two. Now, the uh, difference, the delta between CRN and ERN, was found to be significantly lower in the expressive writing condition than in the control condition, indicating that expressive writing can be used as an effective treatment to reduce ERN levels. Uh, in subjects with GAD. However, also in line with their hypothesis, they did not find any statistically significant difference in the actual performance on the Flanker test as a result of this manipulation. So, what can we conclude from this study? Well, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. The first thing that we can take away is that uh, ERN is not simply a static biomarker for anxiety risk, but is instead more modifiable than we previously thought. Secondarily, expressive writing is one of the ways, our treatment ways, in which this ERN response can be modified. However, it, does, it has been shown that it may lead to increased levels of anxious arousal following the entire completion of the task, as well as there's no actual relationship between these ERN response levels and performance yet. Also, we have to talk about limitations. Uh, the first limitation of the study is its sample size. 40 is a pretty small number. The sample is entirely composed of women, as well as entirely composed of college graduates, or college students, whose relationship between anxiety and performance is probably not generalizable to a larger population. Secondarily, uh, the researchers, while the two groups were randomly sorted, the researchers did not establish a baseline ERN response level for individuals before engaging them in the expressive writing task, meaning that there was no capacity to see the effect on individuals of the expressive writing treatments. Also, the effects were only seen in the short term, with participants uh, taking the flanker task immediately after the expressive writing condition. Future research can look into the long-term effects of a continuous expressive writing practice on baseline ERN levels. And finally, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, anxiety is a spectrum disorder. And so while this particular study uh, targets patients with GAD, future research could look into a larger range of potential applications. Now, uh, while there definitely are limitations to this study, uh, the final results that expressive writing has the potential to, negative, uh, to reduce ERN impacts and therefore reduce the impact of cognitive worry 
are really promising. And this study is just a couple months old, so I'm really looking forward to see how researchers are able to use this information in, a few, in the future, exploring the relationship between anxiety, cognitive processing, and air monitoring. Thank you. Yay! Okay.